Picture Lock is live at the second annual Annapolis Film Festival in the heart of Annapolis, Maryland. We hope to see some awesome films, talk with some awesome filmmakers, and maybe sit in on some awesome panels. Did I say awesome enough? Talk film to me. <laughs> it's all ahead on Picture Lock. I bumped into this tall giant uh, that was introducing the short films and the Q&A afterwards, uh, really respectfully, uh, it's Jacques, Julian Jacques. Dan, 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 dan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyways, um, so Julian, um, how long have you been uh, working with the festival? Is this your first year? I actually been with the festival from the, the beginning. From, okay. um, I was at the very last steering committee, um, and uh, last year I acted as uh, one of the screeners. Um, and this year, I am the, the programming uh, co-chair. So myself and Juliet Birch, who is my uh, my counterpart. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, and you yourself are a lover of film, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would have to be considering we had um, 400 submissions this wow. year. Um, luckily, I have a 20-person committee, so we don't watch every single one of those. Uh, someone in the committee absolutely does, but I. I I luckily don't have to see everything. <laughs> <laughs> right, and so how many films are actually showing this year? I think the final count was 93, oh, wow. I believe. Wow. Um, yeah. So maybe you can talk a little bit about, just in terms of, I've noticed how the shorts are um, broken up into different themes. Mm -hmm. um, so what was the thought process in, in doing that? I do think that's really uh, cool for you know anyone that wants to come and see a short. Obviously, I was in um, one that was uh, the serious yeah. shorts so you know going into it like bring a hanky yeah. or a tissue or something it's not going to be funny so i actually suggested actually doing it as a comedy series but keeping that title <laughs> uh, no one no one wanted to it's, it's the weirdest thing uh, why yeah. why is that but uh, actually one of the cool things in programming is that as you go through and you start having i mean again some 400 films um as you start seeing these things you start seeing these thing these themes kind of slowly develop and you're like oh you're like i started watching the movie like oh you know what I, that reminds me a little bit of this, and like, they, oh, they'd be awesome together, you right. know? And so at a certain point, you just, it kind of na just naturally occurs, you know? Right. Do you know about how many uh, guests will be attending, uh, filmmakers? Um, I, I mean, I think we had like over 50 last year. Um, the number of people I've met this year, I'd say is at least that, if not more. Right, and we're know? just in day two, really like yeah. day one and a half. Yeah, right? it really is, so. yeah. Yeah, um, and considering also it's our second year and having, you know, 90-something films and, you know, 50-plus actors, directors, producers, I mean, there's a guy, a couple of people who have, like, their own um, distribution platforms, uh, you know, mm -hmm. heard of Gather, yeah. um, the, the, the guy who started it. So Gather is one of those platforms that you, um, it's kind of complicated to explain, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's where you, uh, he actually kind of helps you kind of promote, so you kind of use him. You find a location and then together you kind of build this thing. Okay. Um, and so we have him on like panel. I mean, from that to like Gabriele Cristiani, who is uh, the editor for uh, Bernardo Berlucci. You know, this is an incredible Italian filmmaker. She worked on La uh, The Last Emperor. You know, like, right. you know, pretty pretty stellar stuff. You right. Know? Right. I mean, right now in this room we've got um, Spooky Set by the Door playing. You know, where we have this this actor who's been in. And he's one of those, those guys that you, I say his name, you know, Jay Preston. Mm -hmm. Do you know who Jay Preston is? No, I don't. If you're about to make when you boy. see his face, you'll be like, oh my God, I have seen 50 things with that. He was a ju the judge in, um, uh, what was it, A Few Good Men, doing stuff for years and years. I mean, he's been doing, I mean, Spooky Sat by the Doors from the 70s. Mm -hmm. You know, and hey, you poke your head in, you'll be like, oh, oh. You know, so we, we have, have to poke our heads in and the camera. And Oh! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so like, we have him uh, after the showing and then uh, a Q&A with uh, Chris Haley, who is the nephew of Alex Haley. And also the founder, wow. you know, he's the, um, he works at the National Archives, but also is the head of the Kunte, Kunte Kinte Foundation, you know? Wow, that's gotta be pretty interesting, especially Best Picture, 12 Years a Slave. And right. uh, obviously there's the little tie-in with Roots and just, Man, that's, yeah. man, see, come to the Annapolis Film Festival and you are going to be richly blessed 
with people to talk to, giants to run into, and obviously- Well-dressed like giants. Yeah, well-dressed giants. <laughs> Be clear with that. So Julian, were there any uh, films that you did see that really stuck out to you in your mind um, as some of the films that people really need to see? That's a hard question, <laughs> um, because I have seen most of the films. I mean, I think at this, this point, no, I've seen every single film we have in the festival. Mm. Um, I mean, something that stands out, I mean, at this point, too, when you, you see this many things, um, one of the things you start really looking for is what's a different approach to storytelling? You know, like, what's something that you're like, oh, well, I, haven't, I haven't thought of that before? Mm. Uh, especially, you know, between working in film, doing, like, you know, having this, this involvement with a film festival. Um, so like, one of the things that comes to mind immediately is uh, this film called Teenage, which is a, a documentary on the evolution of, of teenagers. You know, 1920s, you were 12 years old, and you were a child, and then what happened next? You're working in mines. You know, mm. you, you went from being a child to an adult overnight. Right. Um, and this kind of chron um, chronicles the evolution of this, this cultural need for a young adult voice and a voice of change. Mm. Um, it's, it's a pretty fascinating idea, you know? Right. Uh, another one comes to mind is The Act of Killing, which was just recently nominated for right. Academy Award. Yeah. Um, you want to see a movie that will stick with you. Um, that movie will. will <laughs> I want to say haunt your dreams, but it will uh, it will definitely make you make you feel blessed for everything you have. You yeah, know? yeah, definitely. I mean, and that is a haunting film in it of itself. Yeah. In the way that they really play with the reenactments of yeah. killing and how these guys really just are able to do it without that remorse or anything. You know. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, definitely a great film. Julian, thank you so much for taking course, the time man, yeah. to speak with My us. Pleasure, yeah. Appreciate it. I can't believe it. I bumped into Hollywood royalty. I have Mr. David Ward and Miss Gabriella Cristiani. If you saw movies like uh, The Last Emperor, Sleepless in Seattle, all the major leagues, then you'd be geeking out as well. <laughs> so thank you all for coming on the show. And as I said, the first question I have for you is, when did you all fall in love with film? When I fell in love with a man. When you fell in love with a man? Was it a man in the film? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> you, have to, you have to go no, explain a little. My husband mm. was Frank Arcali. He made the edit, uh, The Conformist. So let's say about that. Wow. Then, my, he loved Sting. Mine is not nearly that that uh, elevated. I was a ten-year-old boy, in a, sitting in a movie theater watching Prince Valiant. And I was so taken with the sword fighting that I went so, my, sword fighting my way out of the theater. And ever since then, I love movies. Now, I saw Prince Valiant again about five years ago. It's not a great movie, but when you're 10, right. it does, it, that's enough. It's it, does awesome. the, it does the trick. It's really awesome. So I think I could say the same for like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. For yeah. me, like when I, when I saw it, it was amazing. I kicked my dad in the knee coming out of it, but mm -hmm. like if I watch it now, it's like what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying that people should go see Prince Valiant or go rent Prince Valiant. It's not playing anywhere. <laughs> but um, you know, there's always when you're a kid, there's there's some movie that captures your imagination, and right. once a movie's captured your imagination, then I think you're pretty much hooked. So one question that I would love to ask you guys. Um, Part of my show, I really want to focus on uh, independent filmmakers and filmmakers that are coming up. What's some of the advice that you could give them in terms of getting into filmmaking craft with your uh, pr or respective uh, careers? Well, as we were talking about earlier, <laughs> they should really be sure they want to do this because it's not easy. It takes, uh, it takes a lot of determination. It takes a lot of hard work. Uh, you don't get to start at the top. Um, you have to work your way up, and you have to stay true to your to your to your vision, your dedication of what you want to do. Um, I think if you're going to work in independent film, it depends on what you're doing. But you have to think more about lower budgets. You have to think more about doing stuff that's more character oriented, maybe than what the studios are doing, because they tend to they tend to want to do things that are tentpole movies. So it's just a, it's a slightly different discipline. Right. I would like to be a little bit more optimistic. Oh, good, <laughs> good. I'm, there I, is I, one thing. When, if you really, really, really like what you do or you want to do, you will go over everything. 
If you do because you think it's a flash of lights, you think it's uh, you know you're gonna be famous, you're gonna forget it because you might not become any famous. Right. So you have to take the risk for what you like and not for what come, can come out. Regarding the low budget, if you are rich and famous, you ask for some money, they will give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess maybe that. I agree come with on. her. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you, but isn't that true? If, they go if, you're, you? if you're famous, I guess, yeah. yeah. They, but uh, most people who are starting out aren't discount. famous. You have yeah. to discount, but yeah. they, uh, they still pay you. Yeah, well, <laughs> but I mean, to get a start. When right. you're just starting, you have to start smaller. Yes. That's very true. <laughs> so we're here at Annapolis Film Festival. Um, are there any films that you have seen already that you really liked or films that you're looking forward to see? Well, I, you know, I am basically trying to sandwich my appearances at the film festival in between some sessions of writing because I'm under <laughs> deadline to finish the script. Oh, okay. And so I come here and then I go back to the hotel and write. So I, I've only had a chance to see Jamesy e. Boy, which Actually, I'd seen James E. Boy before. It's a it's a wonderful little movie. So okay. Same, same. Same thing. <laughs> last night. Oh my goodness. Okay, I have to ask. So, in terms of writing, do you have any um, set practice that you do um, for writing? How do you uh, actually write? Do you use an outline, note cards, things like that? Oh, at this point, I just kind of start. I, I I know where I want to end. If I don't know where I want to end, then I don't start because I don't know where I'm going. But you know, I, I use I use note cards for a couple key scenes along the way, but I don't outline the whole thing because I don't really know it what it's really going to be until I start to write it. Okay. And then I as I, the more I write it, the more I sort of understand it and feel it, and then and sort of understand where I think it should go. Okay. Are you still writing? I thought yeah. you were transmitting with your <laughs> vibration. Your with your mind. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, do they have an app for that now? Yeah. They have an app. <laughs> okay. An app. You remember I got to get the app then There's because I'm still. I'm. St I'm not only still writing. I'm writing longhand. Wow. I'm, I don't even type. I write longhand. I have a. I have a typist who types my stuff up. Well, this you know how amazing. I edit. I just look at the images and mm -hmm. I just blink and then I. I do that and then I blink. And mm. everything goes. And there it is. Yeah. See, I wish you could do that for writing. Right. If I blink, I'm still looking at a blank page. Do you edit, is it Final Cut Pro or Adobe? I don't Which, know what that is. You know? Okay. I mm. use Avid. You use ah, Avid, yeah. Wow. They don't pay me for that, but um, <laughs> uh, I mean, Avid doesn't pay me, but I have to say it's professional. Mm -hmm. Okay. Though, yeah, it's a very. I disagree. Right. Very good. But I was the first editor who edit nonlinear, you know, offline, whatever. Oh, you were? Wow. Yeah. Wow. I made the only change in history um, in the editing with that. Wow. That's never happened. Well, that's quite an accomplishment. Happened. In yeah, itself. I don't know if it's an accomplishment or, or I made Well, it's very it forward is. looking on your part. Yeah, but uh, um, people believed that only because there is, you know, the electronic device, mm -hmm. they can edit and uh, they forgot about the thought behind the editing. Yes. Uh, how do you decide? how to cut a movie mm -hmm. you still have to watch the movie study the movie read the movie and then give some story the way the movie shows you but if you just chop like a potato mm -hmm. okay you're potato. gonna have a mess i promise <laughs> this is gonna be the last question i just did a women in cinema panel and uh when we were talking one of the things that i brought up was the fact that so many directors that we love and we celebrate have had um women that have been their counterparts in the editing room so we think about martin scorsese um mm -hmm. and the schoenemaker um and how like for 23 films so as a Thelma, Thelma, yes. Yeah. Um, and so, just as an editor, what do you think it is about a woman's touch that bring bringing that movie? Because, like I've said, that you know the movie is made in three parts, right? The movie that you write, the movie that you shoot, and the movie that you edit. Um, but do you have any thoughts uh, on that process? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> as a matter of, of fact, she does. Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know who's making a baby? Women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how do they get to make the baby? Through their body. Okay. Have you ever heard Bertolucci? Well, there's some. Uh, the the man is in there somewhere. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. Um, yeah. wait, wait. <laughs> Bertolucci once said that for him, camera is like uh, when shooting is like getting pregnant of the what is in front. Mm. Then when you're pregnant, somebody has to give birth, and who can give birth, and who can take care of a baby when it's born? You wow. can do too, but you don't have that patience. Oh my, <laughs> my mind is blown. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Answer. Is that, uh, wow. yeah. So, mm. Okay. Wow, that was great. Go with God. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for thank your time, you. Mr. Ward, Ms. Christina. Christiani. Christiani. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> I cannot believe it. I'm here at the Annapolis Film Festival, but look who I ran into. Ben Mamber. Um, <laughs> I know. No stranger to picture lock. Um, so, Bim, obviously Ta, uh, which means grandfather, was in uh, the film festival and I finally got to see it for the first time and I must say, it was, it was incredible. Like, I didn't expect it to be um, as gripping as it was and it's scary, like, but it's short. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Oh. So, um, if you could just give us a summary mm -hmm. of what the film is about and what inspired you to write it. Yeah, um, again, Ata means grand, grandfather in Thai, and um, it's a, a true, I mean, it's based on a true story that um, happened in 1971 when my grandfather was called to help out a um, neighbor who was possessed. And um, it was a story that my aunt told me when I was a little girl, and I just thought that was the coolest story, I, it was my favorite story, and I kept asking her to tell me over and over <laughs> again, so now that I'm, you know, I can make a, a film, it's something that I, I like to do. I thought the first short film that I want to really make it into something, something real, something really good, this should be the story. So is horror a genre that you want to go into? Because, I mean, you did a lot with the shadows, the lighting, which I'd love to ask you how you achieved that, because, I mean, it literally the just looking at the girl that was possessed i mean it didn't seem like there was a whole lot of makeup on her but you really achieved uh this eerie look and feel oh, thank you yeah. well um that was actually the credits all go to go to my crew mm -hmm. um i had a really good really good dp um and also um, um lighting crew um gaffer and actually everything my actors they were fantastic so um I did. I, what, what I did was I told them this is the kind of you know feelings or the mood and tone that I wanted, and they just delivered. The, the crew delivered the actor, even though um, the actors they, they weren't real actors. I mean, not professional actors. Right. They're they're family friends. Like they're there to help me out, but. Um, well, if I have to tell the whole thing, it's just going to be too long. But I'm, I have to say that um, because of how how grand my, my, my grandfather is so um, respected and well known, a lot of people had already know and uh, had already known him, and, and I didn't have to describe much at all of of how he um, carried himself. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I, I never met my grandfather. He oh, died really? two years before I was born. Wow. So this is this is how I. When when I when we were sh shooting the whole thing, that was how I sort of learning about him in uh, a way as well. So some it's like kind of unfolding in front of my eyes. Well, that's it's not only uh, a great way I'm sure for you to learn about him, but this is an awesome tribute to him uh, as well. Just uh, like I said, I just think it's a phenomenal film and a short Thank film. You. And honestly, at the end, there's a little jump scene, and I saw someone jump. I see. I have a trick where I look at the corner of the screen so I don't like jump. I knew something was coming, <laughs> but uh, obviously. So you didn't jump. I, I didn't because I knew something was coming. I was like, oh, I can't. I, I can't jump. I gotta look at the corner of the screen. But somebody in front of me jumped. So I'm telling on. I'm telling on that guy. Success. <laughs> exactly. So, um, and in terms of sound, um, there was a lot of mood uh, just in the score. Um, Who did you collaborate with, um, and was that something that you really wanted going into it? Oh, you mean like for for your score for the for, for um, the film? Um, I I had a well, I had a couple people compose the the score for me, and I actually did 
a couple uh, tunes here and there myself as oh, well wow. just to put in there. Um, but uh, there were a couple ver versions that we did before and it just didn't really, I know it didn't do it. Mm -hmm. So I sent it back to, to a, um, a sound designer and also a mu uh, music composer in Bangkok. Um, and uh, he cleaned everything up for me, also yeah. added um, every little thing that's supposed to, supposed to be on the movie, and um, yeah, composed some fantastic, um, you know, sounds. Yeah, for, for and it, it definitely is, uh, it supplements with the film as it should. So uh, in case someone didn't see uh, a previous Picture Hack episode, how can people check out the film and find you? Um, right now, I have a, a website called um, greenbuckproductions.com slash news that I blog about the movie. Okay. And, uh, I, and also, I, I haven't uploaded it on YouTube yet. I plan to. Okay. And uh, I would like everyone to check it out when, when I launch the... When the movie is available for pub public, I would like to invite everyone to, to see it. I would let you know. I, I, I will let you know absolutely <laughs> when, when, when it's available. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. Cool. So, uh, just one last question. Are you planning on turning this into a feature or? I would love so much to do that. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, the main thing is money. Yes. I, 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 need, I do need to raise um, some money to make a a feature out of this. A, a lot of people have asked me to, you know, to, to make this into a short uh, um, feature film because everyone wants to know more about that. Right. It's <laughs> like, uh, why, how did he become this powerful? Yeah, you, yeah. Should, you should tell more about how, how he, become, he became he, who he is today. Yeah, okay. So. Well, cool. Well, man, thanks again for no, coming thank on the show. It's really good to talk to you. <laughs> Same here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I'm here with Don Camucci, the writer and director of Daughter of Fortune, uh, which I just had the pleasure of watching. Um, Obviously, it's a period piece, and I want to get into that, but Don, the first question I have for you is, when did you first fall in love with film? I fell in love with television, actually. Uh -huh. um, I was completely in love with The X-Files, and I would watch every single episode at least twice, and there are like 202 episodes, so. Wow. I, I've seen some of them five or six times, and so I loved the show. I had to like research it, and I wanted to know everything I could about you know the making of the television show, and so I just realized that that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to make film and TV. Wow. Um, so your film is a very moving piece. Uh, and obviously, it's um, about uh, some of the secrets that, I guess, as blacks, we had to deal with uh, back in the day. Could you just go ahead and explain, give a summary of the film and what it's all about? Um, so there are two summaries. One is basically, <laughs> it's about a film star in the 1950s who's hiding a secret, and it comes out then she'll destroy her perfect world. That's the main one I use, but if you it really want to know- sounds like a log line. It is, <laughs> that's the log line, but if you want to know what it's actually about, it's about a, a light-skinned black woman who is passing for white in the 1950s, and it's about her coming to accept who she is and um, accepting the family that she had basically cut herself off from. And it's interesting, because I was in the uh, Q&A afterwards, and they were talking a little bit about those themes of forgiveness um, and how it seemed like there was a give and take with the family that she came from, as well as her now as she, ste she stepped away from that family. So um, is there any truth to that? And you know, what were some of those things you were thinking about as you wrote it? There, actually, there is. And the thing is, is that I don't think I realized it until I was watching it and somebody said that. Right. And I realized it really is about her forgiving kind of herself and her sisters forgiving her for the things that she had done um, to them. And it's, it's something that I'm kind of going to steal away for the future. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Theme right there. <laughs> right, right. So uh, what inspired you to write it? Um, it's based off of the story of my great aunt um, in the 1950s. She's pa she passed for white in uh, Manhattan, and she was a model. And so I wanted to tell that story for my thesis film. And so I didn't know anything about uh, modeling in the 1950s, but I did know about Hollywood in the 50s. So I decided to kind of transplant the story from Manhattan to LA and take it from there. And that's incredible, the fact that you 
did your thesis film and made it a period piece. Um, I went to uh, film school as well, uh, and that was like one of the number one rules that any professor will tell you. Do not do a period piece out of the gate. So what, what, what made you want to do a period piece? I'm very ambitious. Um, <laughs> and what made me want to do You know, at my school, they kind of have, a, at USC, they had a lot of rules of what you can and cannot do. Like, you shouldn't use animals, you shouldn't use dogs, you shouldn't have cars, you shouldn't use a pool. And I'm happy to say that I use all four things. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the pool did not make it into the film. Uh. Um, but it was really about me wanting to stretch and to grow and to learn. Um, and I knew that I wanted to work on period pieces as a, as a filmmaker, as a, as a feature filmmaker. So I was like, what better time than to do it now when I have the safety net? And then also because of where I went to school, we were able to get a lot of discounts. So right. I was able to make a period piece far cheaper than if I had done it as an independent filmmaker. Okay, so do you want to turn it into a feature or? I would love to turn it into a feature. Very, like really expand upon the, the themes and the new theme I just discovered, <laughs> forgiveness. Um, and, and just really, I want to delve deeper into both worlds, the world of Hollywood into the world of West Virginia. Because I think, I don't think I've, I don't feel like I've seen like a really gritty, honest look of ho at Hollywood in the 50s in a while. Mm. And then also I've never really seen a movie about 50s West Virginia coal mining that's like really gets into the heart of what it means to grow up in a place like that. So I want to kind right. of marry both of them and see what happens. And that's awesome. Um, definitely, I'm rooting for you. The feature, I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Thank if you. it's anything like this short, where can people find you or find uh, the film? Oh, let me see, where can you find the film? Basically, you can kind of find me on Facebook. Um, I have a director's page, and then I also have a, um, I have a film page. So just go to Daughter of Fortune uh, on Facebook, and you can find me. Or uh, my handle on Twitter is Daughter Fortune. So you okay. can contact me that way. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much thank you uh, for much. taking the time to speak with us. And definitely good luck with your film thank and you. filmmaking career. Thank you. That's all for this episode. I'd like to thank Patty White and Lee Anderson for letting us come out. You can check out more about the Annapolis Film Festival at annapolisfilmfestival.net. Of course, you can check out Picture Lock at picturelockshow.com where you can get the latest on film reviews, news, and free screenings in the DMV area. And also, if you'd like to be a guest on the show or be a part of our live studio audience. Until next time, I hope you stay locked on film. <laughs>